This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, okay, well, let's um, move on now um, to uh, the main event, um, which is going to talk about Jean Jaurès. I probably have pronounced that completely wrong. Jaurès. There we are. Um, one thing I do know about him is he had a magnificent beard, um, which is a great <laughs> one. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and th- th- um, this new uh, translation and abridgment um, uh, of the Socialist of the French Revolution is out. Um, we have some copies here uh, at a uh, suitable seminar price. For those of you who haven't yet acquired one, we'll deal with that at the end. Um, but in the meanwhile, over to over to Mitch. Okay, so before I, uh, I get to the talk, uh, which is the theme is it's Jaurès, the last Jacobin. So we'll tell a little bit about the book. The, the complete socialist history is 3,000 pages. This is almost 3,000 pages, about 250. So uh, somebody pointed out to me last week in, in New York that probably we should have called it selections from rather than abridgment, but uh, it's a, you know, 3,000, it's a, you know, massive uh, book that took him 10 years to write, 10 years during which he was uh, active in the Socialist Party, he uh, just got to become a socialist. He was doing the fight over, he started in 1898, finished in 1908. So during that period, he was fighting for Dreyfus, he was going to the battles within the Socialist Movement in France, the battles at the Socialist uh, International, 1904 is the big fight, we'll be discussing it about ministerialism, uh, the unification of the Socialist Party in France, founding l'Humanité, writing uh, Articles almost every single day for L'Humanité, uh, starting work on his other really important theoretical work, The New Army, which is 500 pages, all the while he still managed to turn out 3,000 pages on the, on the French Revolution. And, you know, this, the sad and amazing fact was that it had never been translated into English. And in fact, as I was saying uh, to Keith and Ted, since 1906, this is the first book by Jaurès to come out in English. And in his lifetime, uh, because if any of you would be in Paris, I'm giving a talk on Thursday on this topic on Jaurès in America, that throughout his, his lifetime, from the time the Socialist Party started having its own publications, there was exactly one article by Jaurès published in the American press, in the American Socialist press. That's it. And interesting, what I found really interesting was, uh, and we'll, I'll talk about it a little bit towards the end of this, is what happened when he was assassinated. He was completely ignored during his lifetime. The only references there are to him in the socialist press, because the American Socialist Party had right wing, but it was the left wing was really strong of the Socialist Party. They had no use for Jaurès when, while he was alive. When he was dead, of course, he was, uh, he was deified, but what was really interesting when he died uh, was that how people viewed him now, uh, at that point. So when he died, people on the right of the Socialist Party saw this as the work of, of Germans and imperialists, and it was the beginning, and uh, we know who was behind this. Others on the left wing of the Socialist Party saw him as one of them, and this is going to signal the beginning of the revolution. So Jaurès has, has had, you know, a strange reception. I don't know how it's been in the in the UK. I know, you know Ted and I were, were talking about it. Uh, the New Army, which I'll be discussing, was partially translated in a strange form here in uh, here in England in 1907. I thought it might be a little bit later than that, but uh, just picking and choosing elements from it also, kind of randomly. Uh, but that's that's it. So his two great works. Have really have really not gotten a, a full hearing here, and I have to you know thank David Castle down at the end of the table from Pluto, because he was so supportive of this project from like the day I suggested it to him in October a year and a half ago. He did everything he could to make sure that this happened. So you know I wanted to, I don't often get a chance to see David like never. <laughs> so I just want to want to thank him here. But Jaurès, that he spent so much time on this book, is indicative, obviously, of how important he considered the French Revolution. And in fact, uh, in my eyes, everything about Jaurès, everything about his politics could only be understood 
if you look at it from the point of view that he was the last Jacobin. So a little bit about his life. You know, he was born in 1859 in, uh, in a town in the, in the south of France. And one of the theories why he was so attracted to the French Revolution was because in the region he lived in, it resembled pre conditions in, in pre-revolutionary France. You know, peasants burned with taxes, high rent, interest on mortgages. But his father owned a 510-hectare uh, farm. He immediately stood out for his intelligence. Somebody in his town uh, did everything to encourage him, and he went to Paris to study at the uh, at Louis Le Grand, and then he got into the Ecole Normale. And he was the first. He came. He was admitted first, number one, to the Ecole Normale, ahead of Henri Bergson. However, he graduated third behind Bergson. Now, what's, you know, what's interesting about that also is Bergson lived until World War II. He died, I think, in 1942, which means that Jaurès, had he not been assassinated on July 31st, 1914, he, could have he would have lived through World War I. He would have lived through the rise of fascism, the rise of Nazism, uh, might have even been there for the Popular Front, for, well, obviously the founding of the Communist Party, the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. There's all kinds of questions we'll never be able to answer how he would have reacted. Although we can infer from some of the stuff, and I'll, and I'll talk about that later. Okay, so he was elected to office in 1885, lost the next election in 1889 in honor of the revolution, and then uh, he ran again four years later and was elected. At the time that he entered politics, the right was... Uh, 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 attacking the Republic. So the Republic, he loved the Republic, he loved the Revolution, so he immediately uh, leapt to the defense of the Republic, and this would be a constant theme throughout his life, the defense of the Republic in ways that will shock and horrify some of you when I, when I quote you what he had to say. But he loved the, the Republic because of the Revolution. So in an early speech in the Chamber of Deputies, he said, is the genius of the French Revolution spent do not find in the ideas of the revolution the means of meeting all questions, all problems that appear. So he was, the, the, the revolution was the source of everything. Patriotism was identical with love of the, of the republic, which was the fruit of the revolution, which was the fruit of the Jacobins as far as he was concerned. And so he was a ferocious nationalist in a very curious way, as we'll see. Praising the French even for the heroism in war, through the Francese, their native generosity, and France was indomitable. On every side to which one turns, France, whom they have tried to destroy and whom they thought destroyed, recovers in defeat, more living, more ardent. The old tree has new sap, it's grown leaves again, it's going to bloom again, and, and again the shower, shower the world with the fruits of justice and liberty. So it's the left-wing mission civilisatrice is what we find Haiti? all over, all over Jerez. Sorry, what about Haiti? Uh, it was after the revolution. Yes, it's an I, know, interesting I, know, I know, Hold the question, Glenn. It's an interesting question of when did the revolution end and... and well, no, I'm wondering what Jure, how, how... How Jerez would have reacted to that? Right. right. Well, how did I'll, he I'll, I'll go back. Okay. Right. The, re the little bit more about this. The, the, it came out in four volumes. It ends on the ninth of Thermidor. That's it. Now it was carried on by other people, but Jaurès's account starts with the immediate, uh, the events immediately preceding it, and ends on the ninth Thermidor. Uh, uh, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt, <laughs> Rose Pierre. <laughs> ah, if only Robespierre. Robespierre is uh, is guillotine, and that's when the book ends. So he, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, deal with any of this at Babeuf, but we'll talk about, though, his relations with Babeuf. Okay. France itself, you know, is a transcendent thing, and that it gives every French life meaning. France, when we have disappeared, will not have manifested all its resources. But short as our life may be, we can participate by our work and our hope in the unlimited future of our country. Even he so loved the republic, the idea of the republic, that even the third, he was even willing to say good things about the Third Republic because it was the supreme expression of the revolution. He wanted to change it, but the Republic, nevertheless, was better than any alternative. 
So he was defeated in a crooked election in 1889, and he grew interested in, in, in socialism, particularly in Benoit Malon's synthesis of republicanism and socialism, and he also did, wrote his doctorate. And it was a two-part thing, one on philosophy, one on the German socialist movement, both, of course, written in Latin. <laughs> so I had to teach myself Latin so I could, I was just kidding. Um, so he now, at this point, he calls himself a, a socialist, but not really a Marxist. And Ted can tell you about the old days in Marxist.org when we used to have debates over whether somebody was a Marxist or not. And actually, Jaurès is a really good case for this, for, you know, if you want to even argue so silly a point, what a Marxist is. Because he was clearly a Marxist in some elements and clearly not in others. So, uh, but he wasn't a Marxist because he, he denied class struggle early on anyway, calling for socialism grown not from the violent and exclusive agitation of a social fraction, but from a kind of national movement. And you know this this idea of the nation taking everything in and being stronger than everything. We'll just back up a little bit. This also is very Jacobin, very French Revolution. During the French Revolution, there was the Le, Chapel, the Le Chapelier Law, which banned unions. And whenever I'm sitting with lefties and discussing the French Revolution, which I do as often as I can, we just sit around in Brooklyn talking about, you know, the French Revolution and the Le Chapelier Law. And everybody says, oh, you see, you see how reactionary the Jacobins were? But the fact is, Le Chapelier Law was not anti-working class. Because for the Jacobins, it was one France. It was one republic, one and indivisible. And so if workers are organizing separate from the French nation, it just violates the whole principle. So, I mean, it's a hard... It's a hard sell these days, but that really is. The Jacobins were not anti-working class. It wasn't really a working class anyway. But they just were, were more concerned with the unity of the French nation than anything else. And so this you know, shows up you know, all over Jaurès's uh, writings and thinking. But here we have, again, his love of the French Revolution, which he says in the book, brought about the two essential pre prerequisites for socialism, democracy and capitalism. Yeah. Okay, so he was he was then, and he always would be opposed to violent revolution. Although, if you come to bookmarks, his point of view on violence and revolution was was really you know quite interesting. But he believed that on a whole it was unnecessary in France, which had universal suffrage, which he called the revolutionary instrument of the modern period. So he always hoped he you know Jaurès was a nice person. He was. He was a nice guy. He Leader was a good, of political party. He was a nice person. He was. He was a very nice guy. And so he really did believe you know, in the, the best in everyone. And he thought that given the correct guidance, even the liberal wing of the bourgeoisie, represented by the radical party, capital R, would come over to socialism. Uh, eventually saw that wasn't going anywhere and that only the socialists were interested in uh, social emancipations, and so they needed their own separate organization. He said, while working for the evolution of the entire country toward the republic and the republic toward socialism. See, everything, it's always tied together. The republic and socialism always go together. And in fact, I don't know if I have the quote in this because I found it recently about how you can only be a real republican if you're a socialist. And <laughs> also you can only be a real socialist if you're a republican. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so in everything else, you know, his socialism had national roots. You know, even though he he read the classics, but he, for him, he said all socialism, all collectivism, is not in Marx. It comes in France from French conceptions and French traditions. French socialism respects both social and individual rights. And again, drawing from his Jacobism, it's Jacobinism. It's passionately republican. Never do we separate economic questions from political questions, social justice from liberty, socialism from the republic. So his themes get hammered constantly and in every way. And again, it was as a socialist and as a Jacobin and as a Republican that he joined the fight for Dreyfus, which he was heavily involved in. And in fact, there's a curious passage, anybody you know, who reads the book, where he talks about Bernard Lazare, who was the, really the first Dreyfus art, when everybody, nobody was cared about Dreyfus's case, Ben Alazar, who started out his life as a Jew, anti-Semite, became uh, 
you know, uh, more or less a Zionist, even that today in France, the left-wing Zionist group is the Cercle de Bernard Lazare. He makes a bizarre reference to Lazare, who he was friends with from the time of the Dreyfus affair. Now, you know, we, we all know that everywhere in the world, especially in France, not everybody on the left was very fond of the Dreyfus, uh, of Dreyfus, they could care less about it. And actually, Jaurès was init initially among those who wanted nothing to do, it's, you know, an uh, intra-bourgeois affair, military, the bourgeoisie, to hell with them, you know, let them, you know, devour each other. But he eventually threw himself, you know, wholeheartedly into the, into the, the fight for Dreyfus. And it's one of my, f it's, it's on Marxist.org, the single most curious document of the thousand some odd that I've translated on the website is a letter from Marcel Proust inviting a friend to go with him to see Jean Jaurès. I would love to see the two of them in the same room at the same time. I can't imagine, more, you know, more different characters than Proust. And he went with, I forget which of, which of his aristocratic friends, to see Jaurès, because Proust was a supporter of Dreyfus. In any event, he, he wrote dozens of articles, dedicated all kinds of time to it, but he didn't see the fight for Dreyfus as in any way contradicting his socialist beliefs. And he did it in a really uh, interesting way. As he said about him, if he was condemned against the law, if he was fraudulently condemned, what derision it is to still count him among the privileged. No, he's no longer of that army which, through criminal error, degraded him. He's no longer of those leading classes that by poltroonery of ambition hesitate to reestablish legality and truth for him. He's only an example of human suffering at its most poignant. He's the living witness of the military lie, of political cowardice, of the crimes of authority. Through the misdeed of a society that persists in violence, falsehood, and crime against him, he becomes an element of revolution. So, uh, not many people were saying that. And this is what I would respond to his left-wing critics. But I would add that the socialists who want to get to the bottom of the shameful and criminal secrets contained in this affair aren't dealing only with a worker, they're dealing with the whole working class. So, he completely flips the issue uh, around. This is not an issue of just another officer or another uh, you know, member of the wealthy class who's, you know, be, who's uh, on trial. Just because he's been unfairly accused and unfairly uh, condemned, he now becomes like the avatar of the working class. Um, and he even felt that it was duties of, revo of a revolutionary to defend him. Because who is most threatened today by the arbitrary, arbitrary actions of generals, by the glorified violence of mil military repressions? Who? The proletariat. They thus have an interest of the first order in punishing and discouraging the illegalities and violence of courts martial before they become a kind of habit accepted by all. They have an interest in the first order in precipitating the moral discredit and fall of that high reactionary army that is ready to strike it down tomorrow. So, he gives, he makes the, the Dreyfus case no longer just a moral case. It's a case for every, uh, every person on the left, every socialist. It becomes an element of revolution. And again, he throws in the French Revolution. What have you done with the declaration of the rights of man with individual freedom, we'll ask them. You've scorned them. You've surrendered, turned all this over to the insolence of military power. You are the renegades of the bourgeois revolution. Now, as you can imagine, the far left was not very fond of this, of this position and many others, and I'll, I'll get to how ugly it can get. For example, the Blancists, the Blancists who were great exemplars, you know, holdovers after, after Blanqui's death, they're still on the scene, they're still strong in certain working class neighborhoods, still defending, you know, hardline left positions, and a really revolting mix of left-wing revolutionary thought and furious anti-Semitism. And so when they would write about Jaurès, he was in the pay of the Jews, just flat out. So, so, it, so the result of all this is that Jaurès can now say that he is the true nationalist. If I'm passionately attached to the socialist idea, it's because socialism, in making all citizens associates, abolishes those struggles which make of society a barbaric society. It is we and we alone who are the true nationalists, because we alone can bring profound unity to the nation. He would talk later on about absorbing capital into labor, but again, it's just one French nation, and it's what's going to come out of, out of the socialist uh, struggle. So, 
Now, the logical conclusion of all this, and this is, you know, I could defend most things that Joaz says, but it gets a little bit hairy when it comes to the issue of uh, military, the army, war. So the logical conclusion of everything that he said is that French socialists have to serve and protect the French nation. And they had to be... Circumstance. Well, right, and we'll get to that. Thank you, Glenn. And they had to be internationalist and patriotic at the same time. And the stakes in this kind of fight aren't small, because France is not just any nation. So, you know, if people think, you know, that, that we're, we have a bloated notion of ourselves, you know, the French learn a lot from us. You know, they got a lot of their founding ideas from us, but a bloated notion of their, of their own importance also is kind of American. If we, French and socialists, were indifferent to the honor, to the security, to the prosperity of France, it would not only be a crime against the fatherland, it would be a crime against humanity. A free, great, strong France is necessary to humanity. It is in France that democracy has obtained its most logical form, the Republic. And if France falls, reaction will rise throughout the world. So he went in, in 1896, he would even say the, at, the, at a conference, Parti Ouvrier, uh, France, if attacked, will not have, a more ardent and more, have more ardent and conscientious defenders than the socialists of the Parti Ouvrier, convinced of the great role that is reserved for her in the coming uh, social, social revolution. He wanted to raise the defensive might of the nation. Sorry, excuse me. It's my fault. That's okay. And in 1905, he would say, we must raise to the highest level the defensive might of the nation. The, the second, which we desire with the same firm, firmness, is to increase every day the unity and the action of the proletarians of all countries so that the European proletariat, by its collective and combined action on all governments, forestall as much as possible the explosion of wars. And finally, as a sign of this new European spirit, as a preparation for this better order, we want the French government to propose to all nations for the settling of any conflicts that might arise among them, the systematic and universal practice of international arbitration. This, I have to say, of all of this, this notion of arbitration is a notion that he comes back to really pretty regularly. And if I said that he never, he only had one article that appeared in a socialist newspapers, in the, social, in the socialist press in America, there was a really prestigious magazine called the North American Review that published a, a lengthy article by Jaurès on international arbitration, and uh, which was dimiss, dismissed by the Socialist Party, the Socialist Press, as they can't believe anybody with any kind of brains would write something so puerile and pointless. So, uh, uh, so at any rate, uh, so of course not all socialists, you know, were, were fans of all this, and Gez would write of Jaurès that he is guilty whether he likes it or not. And in spite of the horror he professes to feel for the word, uh, he is guilty of being a nationalist of a new variety, a variety that is more dangerous than the other. So, so violent revolution was, wasn't really necessary or even possible because the course of history ta taught the people that, uh, about their rights, and they would never allow themselves to be ruled by a minority. And it was democracy, the great conquest of the, of the revolution, that would solve all problems and bring about a reign of justice. So as a result of which, he felt, that, and this is his most controversial position, was he believed that socialists should participate in coalition governments. This is the famous notion of ministerialism. Now, the, how, because the way he viewed it was, there were two... No, it's like a Monty Python receipt. There was one, no, no, two. The two main enemies, oh, three, two. Among the enemies of the working class, the main enemies were the church and the military. And anything had to be done to prevent them from uh, getting their hands on the French state. So when uh, the Mitterrand government, uh, when they have a, uh, a radical government, they invite a socialist into the, into the cabinet, Jaurès thinks it's, it's fine. We have to keep the, the church in its place. We have to keep the, the military in its, in its place. Where this becomes, and this is where I've had arguments with it back home, is because in that government was Galifé, the butcher of the Paris Commune. Yeah. So it's, you could, 
there's two ways to look at it. One is Jerez out of his mind, or two is it that the, 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 his fear of the church and of the military was so great that even a compromise like that, we could say if Galifay is going to be in a in a radical government, but he's kind of been defanged, and we have to make sure that we keep the church uh, in its place. So, on the question of revolution, though. He squared the circle by, again, using, always uses examples from the, from the French Revolution. And if we think of revolution, we think of Blancist revolution, where it's a, you know, a small conspiratorial group that's going to like, seize power, everybody's got their code names, or the Bolsheviks, or anything that's, that's uh, come subsequent to that. But he, had, this, he squared the circle of democracy and revolution and reform in a really interesting way. A society takes on a new form only when the immense majority of the individuals who compose it demand or accept a great change. This is self-evident in the case of the revolution of 1789. It broke out and succeeded only because an immense majority, one might say the entire country, wanted it. So in a sense, the French Revolution was a majority vote, except they were voting in the street because they had no other way to vote yet at the time. And you know the book is full of scenes where uh, the people uh, are forever pushing the revolution further to the left and making democracy, putting pressure on the elected representatives to push the revolution to the left. And as far as is is concerned, it's perfectly legit because it's a majority of the people that are doing it. It's a very open question whether it was the majority of the people. And if one of the things that I always say about reading this book is it's a great case for Brasilia and Washington, D.C. Because if anything shows the danger of putting uh, your capital in your main city with an angry populace, it's the French Revolution. You know, if you look at the events when the Gironde is like driven from power, had this happened somewhere like in the middle of nowhere, it might not have happened, but because the, 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 all of the congresses and all the meetings and everything that's going on in the revolution is in Paris, where you have the most militant people, the people of Paris pushed the revolution in a way that it might not have been pushed in other cities. So, uh, you know, I can understand, you know, Brasilia, and you also have that great Oscar Niemeyer uh, architecture. So, he, was, so he also uh, felt that what happened in the French Revolution holds true now. Revolutions will not be accomplished by the action, the sudden surprise stroke of a bold minority, but by the definite and harmonious will of the immense majority of the citizens. Whoever depends on a fortunate turn of events or the chances or hazards of physical force to bring about the revolution and resigns the method of winning over the immense majority of the citizen to our idea will resign at the same time any possibility of transforming the social order. Because if you believe in democracy the way Joez did, you know, a minority imposing its will on the majority is just a violation of absolutely everything that, that he believed in. So, and that's again why, of course, socialists should participate in government. We mustn't fight from the futile distance, but from the heart of the citadel. Have to forestall, the, you know, have to fight the enemy, the clericalism, and the bourgeoisie from within. Now, you're not going to have the grand soir. There's not going to be that one day. There's not going to be October 25th or November 7th, however you want to look at it, the day that socialism is going to be installed. And he had a really interesting metaphor for it. It's going to be a slow process. We shall be aware of having entered the zone of socialism as navigators crossing into the ocean of a new hemisphere, though there is no rope stretched across the ocean to market. One day we're there. We don't know what it is, but we're there. And I don't know that it's entirely by chance that he chose this nautical uh, metaphor because his brother was an admiral. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, so this you know, there are many ways in which he sets himself off from from uh, from Marxists. But this denial that there'd be a radical break is perhaps one of his biggest ways that he breaks with uh, the way most Marxists think. But it also but that doesn't mean you don't act. Uh, in a revolutionary fashion or radical or socialist fashion all along the way. And it's kind of like Pascal's wager is what, he, is what we have here. I ask, this, so I ask the socialists not to specify the date when socialism will triumph. That's impossible to determine. 
I say to them to always live in a socialist state of grace. I mean to always work in each minute, in each hour, to bring about socialism and to re rediscover in it all the effort, all the action, all the power of their thoughts and their lives. So just like in Pascal, and I wrote me my son Pascal, the place Pascal, that if you act, you know, Pascal, if you act as if there's a God, if there is none, you lost nothing, and if, you, if there is, you get paradise. Uh, for Jaurès, we don't know whether it's ever going to happen, but if you always act as a socialist, you can't go wrong. And I don't, if, it, if anybody here has seen uh, Godard's film La Chinoise, there's a scene on the train where uh, Andrzej Zemski is debating this issue with, uh, is with, I'm uh, uh, sorry, Francis Janson, but actually though no, it's in, in, also in My Night at Mods is where it really comes up, where they're discussing Pascal and Jean-Louis Trintignant's best friend is a Marxist and discuss the Marxist implications of it. So, anyway. So, 1904, he's still pushing for uh, socialists to be uh, enter bourgeois governments. 1904, the issue comes to a head at the International Socialist Conference. And this is uh, a beautiful sign of what it was like in the socialist movement then, and it didn't last very long, but also of how respected and loved Jaurès was as a character. So Jaurès uh, uh, is, is condemned by Rosa Luxemburg. She gives a fiery speech, and she calls him the great corrupter of the socialist movement. It comes time for Jaurès to defend himself. He needs a translator. I'm sorry, interpreter. He needs an interpreter. Anybody want to volunteer and, and interpret the speech in German? Rosa Luxemburg, who just called him the great corrupter, says, I'll do it. And she does. And Jaurès's response was, you see, citizens, even in battle, there is cooperation. <laughs> now, what's, this is, in my opinion, what now happens in his life is a sign of his absolute moral superiority over almost anybody else that I've ever come across in the, in the socialist movement. So there have been fights in the socialist movement over ministerialism. Jaurès is the most militant, most vocal supporter for uh, socialists entering bourgeois governments. He's, they put it to a vote. He loses. So what does he do? Does he then take, you know, take, pick up his baseball bat, or cricket bat, or whatever he uses in cricket, and go home? No. He, he put his motion to a vote. It was voted down. I lost. That's it. I'm on your side. He goes home, and they unify all the different factions of the Socialist Party. An extremely rare action. I'm not going to point out at around 1904 what other party, the social, you know, Socialist Party, they did not react this way when positions were not, when, they were, when people's positions weren't accepted. So he goes home, unifies the Socialist Party, and now we have the, the SFIO, which would be the party that would last for decades. So, you know, his absolute lack of sectarianism, his lack of ego when his own positions are voted down, is, as far as I'm concerned, the great lesson that can be learned from Jaurès's life and that wasn't learned from Jaurès's life. He had uh, another really important, uh, strange revision of Marxism was in 1901 and 1902, he wrote a series of articles on the Communist Manifesto, where he does a great rereading of the Communist Manifesto. So. Marx could say, you know, the, work, the proletariat has no country. Jaurès, not revising it, he just interprets it. That's what he was saying was, until now. Now, there's a possibility that we will. And seeing this otherwise, it's just nothing but nonsense. Nothing but nonsense. Because by democratically seizing power, the proletariat could constitute itself as the nation. So they have their own, they, there is a nation, they have to fight within it. So uh, the electoral winning of power will be a long, slow process that we've seen. There'll be a long period where the nation will not be confounded with the proletariat, but when nevertheless the proletarian, on the pain of ruining his basis for action, will be obliged to protect and strengthen the nation as such. Even with the achievement of socialism, there will be common administration by the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and at each moment of the struggle, each of the concessions imposed on the bourgeoisie by the growing proletariat 
is preparatory to this full unity in the future. And we can see where that notion of a long voyage, when one day the result is all socialism. So, you know, uh, saying the workers have no fatherland, there's nothing but a pessimistic boutade. Uh, and it actually explains, but he excuses Marx. I mean, it, Marx was right for the moment he wrote. He wrote at a time of economic, when the economic crisis was at its height and proletarian power at its lowest. So nevertheless, but you know, but he wasn't strictly a Bernstein type revisionist. There were still conflicting classes and interests, and there is a definite line of demarcation between the classes. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead here. The maybe the the compl most complete uh, explanation of his ideas are in his book on the New Army, which seems like an unpromising place to find a man explaining his. Uh, his vision of a socialist future, but the subtitle of the book was The Socialist Organization of France. And so he, what he uh, for him, the, the army would be uh, an exemplar of, of the new France. So he had, the, the book had, how many was it? 21? 18 main points. But it's really interesting how he wants to do this. Now remember, the French army was aristocratic. You have all the deux and all the everything in the, in the French army. So it wasn't like say the, you know, the American army, which only had 100,000 people in 1914. That's it. There really was no professional army. The officers came out of the middle class to get named to West Point. It's a completely different situation you know, in a country like France. So he wants to completely change the nature of the French uh, army, and in doing so, change the nature, nature of France. So this will sound familiar. If, uh, you're borrowing from uh, Switzerland. He couldn't borrow from Israel because it didn't exist yet. All city, healthy citizens from 20 to 45 will participate in defense activities. Those from 20 to 34 in the active army, serving near their homes. Military ed education started age 10, age 10, very Spartan, with gymnastics and exercise. And actually, you know what, now that I've said that, we all know how uh, important the, the antiquity was to the, to the French Revolution. Gracchus Babeuf. Uh, so, I'm being a wise ass saying uh, that it was spawned, but it really is uh, inspired by the by antiquity. Twenty-one men serve six months and then serve eight ten-day periods till they're thirty-four, and the only non-coms will be professional soldiers or those who are uh, do educational work. All others will be chosen from the ranks after three months in recognition of their talent, but only one third of officers can be professionals. And workers' associations, unions, are encouraged to train their members showing military aptitude. So the working class is going to absorb, is going to become the army. So it's going to be a working class, a national army, not just an army of the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. Uh, so actually, and those who have the bachelier there at the back can be admitted after passing a test to enter the military schools in six universities around France. So he wants to decentralize things, uh, make it open to the working class, and reduce the number of professionals and aristocrats in the army. And, but he ends with these words, these last words of the books. Any government entering a war without having proposed publicly and faithfully a solution through arbitration will be considered a traitor to France and men, a public enemy of the fatherland and humanity. The constitution and national duty of the citizens shall be to smash this government and replace it with a government in good faith. So uh, we'll see what happens a couple of years from then when uh, World War I is on the horizon. Now, uh, I'm going to take it here. You know, he's, all the while he viewed the Socialist Party as a workers' party that appealed to the petty bourgeoisie in order to pave the way to socialism. And his minimal program we summed up in just three points. The attainment of immediate reforms like the five and a half day week, minimum wage laws, income tax, government alcohol monopoly, and old age pensions. The conquest of the state by democratic actions and socialization of industry by repurchase. And this was the one article that was published in the American Socialist Press was all about how the uh, government, the French government as it existed, had the right to buy out uh, all the factories. But again, oh, there's the Republic. However iniquitous, however bourgeois, however reddened with the blood of the workers it might be, it is still the definitive form of democracy. Whoever is not a socialist today is not a Republican. 
Now, of, you know, his love for the French Revolution, and this, these are my favorite passages in this book. Too many historians of the French Revolution view it either as, like Michelet, who wrote his great books in the middle of the 19th century, Michelet's history of the French Revolution is like reading a Dickens novel. You hear, so, you know, uh, uh, once, whatever somebody is, is on page one is what they're going to be on page 90 and on page 900. You hear the name Uriah Heep, you know what Uriah Heep is always going to be. And in too many histories of the French uh, Revolution, the same thing happens. That, for example, in Michelet, it doesn't matter what happens. Mara is always the devil incarnate. It, uh, whatever event happens, whatever Mara did, it was rotten. And what's really interesting is that the latest edition of Michelet, which is like this big, um, has is really thoroughly footnoted. And I actually stopped looking at the footnotes when I, when I read it a couple of years ago, because what the footnotes say is, well, this isn't what actually happened. Because he really dealt it, it was like a moral tale. And so, you know, Marat actually didn't do that. No, Robespierre never really said that. But that's what he does. Jaurès, what's beautiful about, what's really beautiful and moving about this book, and I don't know how, probably you, I don't know, you were definitely working at Pluto at the time when you guys published uh, the excerpt from Guérin's uh, Class Struggle in the First Republic. I got my copy of it in the 70s. Were you <laughs> I born? I remember that. Oh, all right. Okay. But Guérin, has anybody here read Guérin's uh, uh, Class Struggle in the, in the First Republic? Okay. It's, I was asked to translate it. It's 1,200 pages. I, I was asked to do the whole thing. One of the things that when you're a translator is, you know, my wife won't take this wrong. It's like you're living with the person. And you really only want to live with, you know, in my case, I love my wife. But if you want to translate somebody, you have to at least like the person. <laughs> and translating Jaurès was really a pleasure because, like I said, he's a nice guy. He really is a pleasant person. You know, Keith was talking about the beard. He was famous for wearing, you know, a boater. He was a nice person. So when you're translating him, it's, it's just a joy. Because you know he's never going to be like, take cheap shots. Guérin does nothing but take, you know, just, you know, dismisses. For example, there's no point in reading this because as far as Guérin who's concer is concerned, um, Jaurès was nothing but a social, uh, a social democrat. That's it. So that, that's it. We're finished. No more, more discussion. Hates absolutely everybody. Everybody was a traitor to the revolution. And his main complaint is, it comes down to is, Robespierre wasn't Lenin. You won't find any of that, you know, I was going to say Baruch Hashem, but I don't know if anybody here yet. Um, you won't get any of that in Jaurès. Because what he recognizes more than anything, and it's really important for everybody to recognize when we look at the French Revolution, indeed any like great historical event, is they were acting, these guys were flying blind. There was nobody, you certainly couldn't copy the American Revolution, even though they were inspired with the Declaration of the Rights of Man, but the American Revolution wasn't really a revolution. Oh, I'm fed, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the UK. Uh, <laughs> we just threw off the yoke of you know the monarchy, but nothing really changed in the social system. Slavery was still slavery. You know all the lunacy we have in our in our political system is a, it was because we wanted to keep make sure that the people had no direct say in voting for the president. So there's all you know it wasn't a real revolution in the sense that the French Revolution was in completely <laughs> overturning the, the the whole social system. So he you have to give them credit. So what he said was. What must never be forgotten when judging these men is that the problems fate imposed on them were formidable and probably beyond human strength. Perhaps it wasn't possible for one generation alone to bring down the Ancien Régime, create new laws and rights, raise an enlightened and proud people from the depths of ignorance, poverty, and misery, fight against an international league of tyrants and slaves, and put all passions and forces to use in this combat, while at the same time ensuring the evolution of the fevered, exhausted country toward normal order and, uh, normal order and well-ordered freedom. The France of the Revolution required a century, countless trials, backslidings into monarchy, reawakenings of the Republic, invasions, dismemberments, coup d'etat, and civil wars before it finally arrived at the organization of the Republic. And this is where he, t he then ties it in directly uh, 
the actions of the revolutionaries to his own actions uh, in the early 20th century. In an important sense, in the sense Babeuf meant when he, he invoked it in speaking of Robespierre, we are the party of democracy in the revolution, but we haven't shackled and frozen it. We don't claim to have fixed human society in the economic and social formulae that prevailed between 1789 and 1795 and which responded to living in economic conditions that are no more. The bourgeois democratic parties too often limit themselves to picking out a few fragments of cool, cooled off lava from the foot of the volcano to scooping up some extinguished ash from around the blaze. Instead of this, the molten metal must be poured into new moles. In this way, socialism attached to the revolution without being chained to it. And usually, when I read this passage, what we end up discussing is the ways in which Marxism, too much of Marxism, too much of the left, of, of the left has been tied to the notion that there's a model and that it has to be followed. And that you, know, you anathematize people who don't follow the model. For Jaurès, the French Revolution mattered, but he's not gonna tie himself to the ideas of 1789, or 1793, or 1795, in 1904 and 1905. In the same way, we, a hundred and some odd years later, shouldn't be tying ourselves to ideas, or we should be revising the ideas, you know, as radically as possible, and apply them, you know, in, in, to our own situations. So, you know, we now get to the final part of Jaurès's life, the fight for peace. So he, socialists opposed the war, we all know that, but he made it clear that peace must not be at any price, not peace at the price of independence. Peace should be secondary to the security, the dignity, and pride of France. On the other hand though, Glenn, hmm. uh, revolution was permissible. That if a government starts an aggressive war, then he believed it was up to the working class to have a general strike and a revolution. The tricky part of this, though, you know, and by doing this, he said this would prevent war from happening because the bourgeoisie would know that in unleashing war, they unleash the revolution. So this would scare the ruling class away from war. However, the problem is how can you tell in the heat of events who's the aggressor? And so given Jaurès's you know, love of France, how could you judge in the heat of events in the spring and summer of 1914 who was the aggressor and who wasn't? You know, historians go over it, you know, 100 years later and they revise who was really pushed who into the war. You know, it was kind of naive on Jaurès's part to think that you could just like right there on the spot in the middle of everything decide who was at fault. But, uh, Here's what he, but he, in 1905, he laid out what he would continue to follow as his ideas. I believe the existence of autonomous fatherlands is necessary to humanity. I particularly believe that the disappearance or the domestication of France, enslaved to foreign will, would be a disaster for the human race. Okay? I add that it is the duty of all citizens to be passionately attached to peace, thus the international entente of proletarians, signifying to all their governments that they want no more war, is one of the most important guarantees of peace. But if despite all this war breaks out, even if it's the greatest folly, the most unjust, the duty of all citizens will be to fight to ensure that the fatherland's independent not be swept away in the storm unleashed by the crimes of their leaders. But we are not held to a government of adventure and crime or to a social order surrendered to envy and violence. So Ghana has it. You have to decide when is it that you're in a government of adventure and violence. Uh, now, so World War I. You're saying, though, that yeah. even if it is, we've still got an OPB. No, that's the exception. That you're no longer bound by anything. You could break out, no, not, you, that all bets are off. If it's a, you know the, if the French were to invade, then this, this is a, a an illegitimate government general strike, stop the war, shut the place down. It's perfectly legitimate. But so Germany invaded Belgium. Well, so what I'm saying. Well, what happens? Well, so the Belgians, you see, it, well, the Bel is he was more than suspicious of the Germans and especially of the Austrians. That in his final days, I read all the articles in the Manite in the last month of his life, 
and it's full of anti-Austrian articles. So, uh, uh, so he knows that uh, it's, his position is marked out. However, he's also organizing an international conference that was supposed to take place in Brussels in September 1914. This was his final activity. He was working furiously because he still thought that the workers could stop the war. Somebody was going to be the aggressor. So it was up to the uh, workers in the aggressor nation to uh, prevent their country from going to war, starting the general strike. This would set off general strikes and revolution and everything all over Europe, and it would be the end of everything. Uh, but you know, he was really strongly anti-Austrian, and he wrote on June 30th, uh, 1914, right after the assassination in Sarajevo, if they persist in their policy of brutality and oppression, if they want to avenge themselves for the attack on an entire people, they'll aggravate the crisis. There's only one wise and effective method, and that's practicing an equitable and generous policy towards the Bosnian and Serb elements. So he's trying to uh, counsel wisdom to the Austrians. They weren't having any of it. So uh, Austria issues an ultimatum. Jerez de uh, denounces it. And on the day before his assassination, in an article that he wrote from Brussels called The International Against the War, he spoke of Austria's disquiet and a conference was called actually August 9th, and he said, socialists everywhere are aware of their duty. The vigorous demonstrations of the German socialists are a magnificent response to those who denounce the so-called inertia of our comrades. So he still believed the German socialists were gonna prevent the war from happening. Uh, on the 30th, the socialist group in the Chamber of Deputies decided it would organize a large demonstration and the headline on that day was, Peace Remains Possible. The headline the next day was, Jaurès Assassinated. So, the, you know, Jaurès's posterity. Now, the, you know, the question that people like to debate, maybe we'll talk about it afterwards, is what would Jaurès have done had he not been killed on July with, with France going to war? And there are those, there are those who think that they're like, you know, shocking me by telling me that he would have supported it. Seems pretty obvious that he would have. But, uh, however, Jaurès, you know, he gets dismissed, as I said, like on Marxist, you know, the Marxist Internet Archive, wasn't considered a Marxist, to moderate the, the, the ministerialism, he didn't consider himself a Marxist. But he always called for the absorption of capital into labor. He always used the word socialist. And so if people think that he was anything like a laborite, you know, or any, he wasn't. He never didn't use the word socialism. He used the word socialism. He used the word revolution. He really, he, 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 in working class taking power, he really was a socialist, just in, in his French fashion. And he, uh, you know, throughout the, the, the socialist history, the passages in here and the whole thing, he has nothing but praise for Babeuf. And actually, I have to say, that was one that kind of surprised me. Because Babeuf does not seem like somebody that, uh, that Jaurès would have gone for, but he sees them as the father of communism. He doesn't say socialism, the father of communism, which doesn't have anything negative to say about. It. And there wasn't even a communist movement at the time. But what's the greatest moment in his posterity was 1924. 1924, he's moved to the Pantheon. Okay? Now, Keith, you were talking about the beard. They put a statue in front of the Pantheon of him giving a speech. It's like a big, flowing beard, a hat. It's great. You would love it. You would love it. Uh, but he's moved to the Pantheon, and so there's going to be a huge thing, you know, all the usual governmental blah, blah, blah. The communists organize a counter-pantheonization. Now, this is the Communist Party of 1924. So we can't dismiss it as the Communist Party of Duclos and Torres. This was still the Communist Party of like the early days of the Comintern and you know whatever you know that's worth. But uh, his body is transferred from the south of France out to the Pantheon. It's people from it's miners who stand vigil over his body. And so when he's uh, transferred to the Pantheon, the Communists hold their own demonstration. And because they want to, uh, it was to say 200,000 workers behind the action committee rest Jean Jaurès from the Social Democrats and Radicals, capital R, and entrust him to the Bolshevik Revolution. 
the Politburo of the Communist Party issued a statement that said Jaurès was abandoning one after another his gravest pacifist and democratic illusions in the period leader, leading up to his death. And, he can't be, and that if he can't be placed alongside Lenin, he is at antipodes, or antipodes, from Bloom, Paul Fornowski, and Schneiderman. Uh, who he said the people in the Socialist Party were seeking to assassinate him a second time by burying him beneath a shameful veil of forgetfulness and what was essential in his life and led to his death, his bitter struggle against chauvinism, imperialism, and exploitative capitalism. We don't know if he would have been a communist, but the communists made sure that he was one of them. And in fact, uh, the great writer Paul Nizan, friend of Sartre, split with Sartre, with Sartre joined the Communist Party, 1939, he quits the Communist Party, uh, gets killed at the Battle of Dunkirk. In his uh, second novel, La Conspiration, there's a long chapter about how moving and important it was to young communists, the whole ceremony when Jaurès was transferred to the Pantheon. So he was, that, that if we look back at him and just view him as this like, like I said, nice guy with his boater and his beard, who was nothing but a reformist, that wasn't the way that he was viewed uh, you know, in the years after his death. You know, whether he would have accepted the 21 conditions to join the common turn, never know. Mm -hmm. But there's like no question you know, that he would have been like, at the heart of all the fights up until the end. And he was last week to get in the mood to come to, come to, to London, I was reading Orwell and he had a great line in uh, uh, The Road to Wigan Pier because he would have fulfilled perfectly Orwell's description of socialism, which is justice plus decency. Thank you.